All right, so we're going to be in Daniel chapter 3. We're going to read the whole chapter. Uh, before that, though, a couple questions for y'all. One, uh, we're talking about worship tonight and kind of kingdom worship and how the kingdom of heaven promotes the worship of God, but also the kingdom of this world promotes the worship of other things, including oneself, right? Um, but let's let's say we're speaking, you're, you're in class or you're having lunch and there's someone sitting across the table from you who is not a Christian, they didn't grow up in church, don't, don't know the Bible at all, and you're trying to, to, to tell them about what you learned tonight. Um, what is worship? How would you tell them with, with no kind of Christianese, but just simply like, what is worship? You no, sorry, I actually almost just answered. Okay. So. Thank you for that. What do you guys think? What What is worship? Being Christian and uh, someone just randomly asks you what is worship. Okay. Yeah, a way to show your love for God. What I mean by Christianese is like, say it without like using Bible lingo. Like in in big picture, what is worship? Not necessarily like in the Christian context. What is like in general? What is worship? What does it mean when we're worshiping something? A certain way you connect with something. Okay. Yeah, putting something, I guess, ahead of other things. Okay. Any other thoughts? Using, or words you might use? What? Using, like, respect. Okay. Like, it's usually, you know, like, something that's worth worshiping, you know, so, like, being respected and so forth. Mm -hmm. So, obviously, like, we worship God because he's worshiping us by God. No, that's good. That's good. You said it. Okay, so he's going to throw up some stuff back there. Uh, but Marion Webster gives this definition to honor or show reverence. Um, I don't know why they put it for as a divine being or supernatural power. And then to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. Okay. Uh, so we talk about worship in the Bible. There's a couple different words that are used. Matthew 4, 9, we see uh, the word worship. Um, Jesus actually quotes Deuteronomy 6.13, so we'll go to that one in a, in a second. But Matthew 4.9, Jesus says, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That word for worship is the Greek word uh, proskuneo, maybe. But that word means to kiss the ground when prostrate before a, a superior. Um, to worship ready, to fall, to fall down, prostrate oneself, to adore on one's knees. So it's basically kind of the idea of like falling in your face before a person of authority or in this sense, worship to God. That's the word Jesus is using when he says, worship the Lord, like be before God only. But the, what he's quoting is Deuteronomy 6, 13, which actually says you must fear the Lord your God. It doesn't use the word worship and serve him only, which is the same word Jesus uses. Now, what's interesting is um, the New American Standard Bible says, fear the Lord your God and you shall worship him only. So the words serve and worship are interchangeable in that verse. Uh, so this is what I would say in all of this. Um, what does this mean? What, okay, well, okay, what does this mean? So the New Testament idea of worship is a deep sign of reverence, respect, of falling on your face before. That's the, the worship that Jesus is speaking of, right? Old Testament worship is in a place of service so it's kind of twofold worship is both our surrender and our service to god Does that make sense so holy fear or reverence or falling on your face is the the spiritual attitude that we carry in worship that this is about me honoring my king but the the act of service is the the acts of worship, like I'm sacrificing, I'm giving of myself, I'm serving the Lord because he's my king. All right, so that's kind of the ideas and, and I just kind of lay that out there uh, because I think a lot of times worship in, in, a, in a church setting is we usually connotate that with this, with, with singing, praises to God. 
which is a part of that, is a celebration of God. It's in reverence and respect and honor of God. But there is a place of, again, surrender or submission even, and service. Okay, those two are the kind of compare. Okay, so let's go ahead and hit Daniel chapter 3. And again, tonight we're, we're doing a lot of discussion. Um, so feel free if you have questions or thoughts, feel free to chime in uh, as you will. Okay, so normal first question for you guys. You know, what, what stands out to you? What, what kind of speaks to you as, as we read? So. Uh, where is Daniel in this? That's it's a good question. Because it, he came in with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and mm -hmm. they were, I guess, taken, yeah. enslaved, whatever you'd like to call mm -hmm. it. So where did he go? <laughs> Yeah, so we see in verse 48 of chapter 2, then the king appointed Daniel to a high position and gave him many valuable gifts. He made Daniel ruler over the whole province of Babylon. So I'm thinking he's just, somewhere else. he's in a place, a higher office where he doesn't have to be wherever they are. Or maybe he's up by the king as this is happening and he's not really required. Like, it, mm -hmm. I don't know. There's a... And I don't remember what's so like a Bible series, like it's like a live action thing. Uh, I I'll, I tried to find it, but where it shows this big statue, and it says that the statue is built out on the plain of Dura, which is kind of like the image of, for lack of a better picture, like imagine a big statue out on the quad, and it's like this grassy area, and like all the people of Babylon, which obviously would be a lot bigger, are kind of out there. And then what you would have is the king and probably his high officials sitting up kind of above everybody or away from people, kind of just watching the situation. Uh, and so that's why I think they can kind of spot Shadrach. It would be kind of easy with everyone on the ground and then these three guys just standing there. It would be kind of easy to spot them. But that would be what I would think is I, – I don't think Daniel bowed. I mean, you might could say that, but I, I don't think he would after he – after the first two chapters and even like later on when we see – the story of King Darius and prayer, Daniel's character, I think, won't, wouldn't have let him bow. So, but I think there's a position that he maybe had that that wasn't required of him. Would be my assumption. I don't know that for sure, but that would be my assumption. Other thoughts? Something that stands out to you, or questions, or. Even under threat of their life, for sure. One of the things that influenced Nebuchadnezzar was that they was that they were willing to die instead of worship. They got over their own. Mm -hmm. That he made a point to mention. Yeah. Yeah. Anything for you, Kara, that stood out or spoke to you or no? They've got to it. Okay. All right, so let's let's hit a few things just so we all are on the same page with the chapter. Okay, so the chapter begins. Nebuchadnezzar builds this big golden statue. Why? Where does he even get the idea? Where does that come from? Mm -hmm. Statue cool. What? The dream. The dream. Remember in chapter two. What? Do you remember the breakdown? Okay. I got to go back. What's the top? Gold. Head of gold, oh. which represents. Uh, it's Babylon. Babylon. Oh. What kind of statue does Nebuchadnezzar build? A gold statue. A giant gold statue. Okay. So, head of gold, chest of silver, which represents the Medo Persian Empire. Then we have bronze, kind of thigh or waist, whatever, which represents the kingdom of Greece. And then we have legs of iron, which would have been the Roman Empire. And then uh, iron and clay, which is kind of a mix like the Holy Roman Empire and other empires that we see. And so it's interesting how, remember in uh, chapter 2 that, that Nebuchadnezzar has this dream, and he calls for his, his wise men, if you will. And he says, tell me, he, he wants them to tell him, tell me what my dream was without me having to tell you. And then interpret it. And they're like, dude, you're crazy. You're like, no one can do that. And then Daniel... God gives Daniel the dream and the interpretation. So Daniel basically tells him all of this stuff. Now, do you remember what perspective this is from? Like so, what perspective the dream is from? Remember, so these are the kingdoms, and there's a certain way that, that 
a perspective of viewing these. And then later in chapter seven, we see the same kingdoms as beasts, right? And whose perspective is that from? So do you remember? But this one's from Nebuchadnezzar's point. Yeah, it's from human. It's a human perspective of worldly kingdoms. And then chapter seven with the different beasts, it's God's perspective of the spiritual kingdoms behind him. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar is, is viewing this statue and thinking, my kingdom is the greatest. And so what, uh, this is a really obvious question, but like, what is he responding with? Like what kind of attitude, what, what's happening inside of Nebuchadnezzar to make him want to do this? Pride. Pride, yeah, obvious question. He's seeing that and, and not hearing the dream of, of what Daniel is saying is like, hey, there's a greater kingdom that's coming in the kingdom of Christ. And also that God is the one who's giving you your throne. He's not hearing any of that. He's hearing, I'm the head of gold. I, as, as they say today, I am him, right? This is Nebuchadnezzar's response. So he builds this big old statue and he commands that the people fall down and worship it at the sound of music, which is kind of interesting because we're, we're kind of talking about worship. And in our culture, worship very much is associated with music, right? So as he makes this declaration, he also this is like a punishment. If you don't bow down and worship, you're thrown into the fire furnace. Now, before Ian shows the picture, um, any guesses on like what this would have actually looked like and what would it have been used for? I mean, did he have just a furnace lying around to cook people? Like what, what is the point of this furnace and what would it, how would they even have, have gotten the heat? Is this like a kiln and so there's a walk in furnace and you close the door and bake pottery with it? That's pretty close. If you want to throw it up there, you're not cold. Yeah, so um, the furnace itself According to biblical accounts, the fire furnace in Daniel 3 was likely a large brick uh, kindling used for baking bricks uh, with an open top and side door allowing the king to see inside. Um, uh, the intense heat was likely controlled by billows, which are like these fans that push air. And they, they probably pushed enough air in because the king says, he, when, when they refuse to bow, it says that he says, you know, jack it up seven times hotter uh, and so this is kind of what it would have looked like like you would have been able to see these men inside these flames uh, and so it's just kind of interesting to understand a little historically so almost imagine have you ever been to like a brick oven pizza type thing like imagine that but on a much bigger scale and instead of cooking pizzas it's usually made for like cooking bricks or things like that as they build these different palaces and other things like they would use that um, and they probably used it for the gold as well like to melt that gold down and they probably had to intensify the heat uh, so also I think it's so there's a on YouTube there's a, a kids Bible program called uh, Superbook I just want to blank it Superbook and in that they kind of like cartoonishly animate the story and in that, it kind of has this, and the top is open, and these guards would have come and they just pushed the guys in into it. But the flames are so hot that the guards are actually, in order to get them close enough to push them in, the guards actually are engulfed in flames and they are killed, which just shows like how hot. Now, I don't, I didn't look up how hot it would be, um, but that's kind of the actual historical image of of this fiery furnace, okay? Uh, and again, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Does anybody remember their their actual Hebrew names? Ian taught on it uh, about probably a month ago. So. Uh, so their names are Hananiah, which is Shadrach, uh, Mishael, which is Meshach, and then Azariah, which is Abednego's name. So they don't bow, they get snitched on, uh, and then they're brought before the king. And then let's read, reread, okay, verses 13 through 18, because I think it's it's interesting to kind of get how they're speaking to the king. Obviously, the king's like, look, dude, I'm going to give you one more chance. If you don't do it, I'm going to cook you. 
And this is their response, 13 through 18. Uh, actually, sorry, 16 through 18 is their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego reply, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. What do you guys think about that? What what kind of strikes you about what they're saying or how they're speaking? Or I mean, they're still somewhat respectful, but mm -hmm. also like firm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Additional thoughts? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It shows that they believe God can and they they have believed that he will save them. But then also there's still an attitude of even if he doesn't, because they're not they recognize he's ultimately God and he, he's the one who makes that decision. Like it's not like they're like, okay, God, you better make this happen. It's but even if he doesn't, we want you to know it doesn't matter. We're not gonna serve your gods. Even if we die in this furnace. We're going to die because we are committed to worshiping God alone. Okay. And I agree with Seth. In the, they're still speaking pretty respectfully. Um, where's that? He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. Like, that's still a pretty respectful attitude, even though this king's about to throw them into the furnace. And in there, like, holding a place of faith and rejection of, of what his command is. Okay. So, call it total side. You can still give respect and honor to people, even though you're choosing to obey God instead of them, right? That's a whole different sermon. But no, you can still respect and honor people, even when you're choosing to obey God over them, right? Uh, so the throne in the fire furnace, it's, it's intensified seven times hotter, which again, I don't have the actual numbers. And I don't, I don't really know if they for, could for sure give you that, but maybe they can. Maybe that historical data is out there somewhere. Um, but when they come out, what someone reread verse 27, what does it say about when they come out? They don't smell like smoke, they don't, uh, they aren't no hair is singed, mm -hmm. their clothes aren't scorched, and they don't smell like smoke. Yeah, yeah. Also, it says that there, Nebuchadnezzar sees four men walking, walking around in the fire. So when they came in. They're bound, remember? And so, A, the fire destroys the ropes that they are wrapped up in. So the, it's not like the fire was turned off. Like, it just didn't affect them. Yes, question? It's not a question. I found the answer. So okay. said back then, a brick kiln would reach, uh, reach roughly 1,832 degrees Fahrenheit which means that would be 12,824 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 3,000 degrees hotter than the surface of the sun. Sheesh. And it's seven times better. Is that no, 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 no. That's the, what, seven that's times seven Yeah, times. That is, the seven times is 3,000 degrees hotter than the surface of the sun. Wow. That's crazy. It says, I'm going to the exact same thing. Okay. It says that seven times more fuel, not seven times the temperature. It's so he, oh, was okay. saying, he was saying, just keep. Yeah, just, just keep pumping it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, 1,832 degrees. I mean, either way, if, once you get over 1,000 degrees, you, you're, well, you're you're cooking. You're cooking yeah, anything yeah. that goes in there. Do what? Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely incinerated. Uh, very quickly, you did. Right? Um, but we see... The angel of God, a lot of people will say that, that this is Christ there in the fire with him, but um, it just says, he says, that, I, I see another man in the fourth looks like a God that might have been a description of an angel. Who knows? But God was there with them. God sent someone to be there with them in the fire and to ultimately protect them and lead them out of that um, because they were uncompromised in their worship. Uh, and in, what was the result of their mm -hmm. salvation? Uh, they were raised to a higher power. Like they get to be promoted. Okay. Yes. What happens uh, right before that? Uh, their bodies, they 
Yet, Nebuchadnezzar, these Babylonians, praised the God of the Hebrews. Because Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to risk their lives to be committed to worship the only God, God does a miracle, and now these Babylonian worshipers are now worshiping and praising the God that they serve. Uh, so it's a pretty incredible thing. They turned even from their false gods and now recognizing and respecting the God, uh, Yahweh. All right. Any other thoughts, comments with anything there? Or question? We're good. Everyone on the same page is kind of what all, what's all happening. Okay. So let's talk about truths now. What does God want to teach us from this? So I'll ask you guys, like, what do you feel like some truths or some, some like takeaways? What are some things from this story that you think are actually things that we need to learn? Mm -hmm. I guess there's always parts of your life. Absolutely. Other thoughts, other lessons, other takeaways, truths? Willingness to sacrifice yourself. Willingness to sacrifice yourself. For Jesus. For Jesus, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So for me, in this, like, really sensing God speaking in, in kind of pushing towards worship and like you see that over and over again even with with the Shadr Meshach and Abednego where he says we will not serve your gods which serve kind of is more of what we see from Deuteronomy as like worship serving God and then they say or worship the gold statue specifically like we won't fall prostrate on our faces which is the New Testament worship um, before your God before this statue okay uh, so surrender and service our surrender and service belongs to God alone okay? so this would be the truth that I would what I felt like God specifically say and you'll see it behind me worship belongs to God alone but he is not the only one who desires our worship alright worship belongs to God alone but he is not the only one who desires our worship Uh, so let's go to, we're going to read a couple different, or a few different places and, and have some more conversation. So, uh, does anybody remember the Ten Commandments, the first two of the Ten Commandments? No idols. Hmm? No idols, also no other gods before me. Or the, no, that's one and two. No other gods before me and no idols. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Exodus chapter 20. Uh, is it Bob? No. Exodus 23 through 6 says this. Uh, you must not have any other gods but me. This is New Living. You must not make for yourselves an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them. That's kind of the, the New Testament image worship. Or worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods that that word right there is just that phrase is really interesting I'll come back to it um, then he says I lay the sins of the parents upon their children the entire family is affected even children in the third and fourth generations of those who reject me and then verse 6 but I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commandments right and so we here here have the first two commandments that speaks to no other gods but the lord but then also you shall not make any idols of any 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 creature or anything like that and then there's something really interesting that is highlighted first of all the character of god for i am a jealous god jealous for your affection it says your i will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. Now, when I read that, so we got Karen, Ian are engaged, we got Isaac, Sophie are married. Um, this image is very much like a covenant image. Um, you know, if if I'm showing affection for other women besides Michelle, 
Michelle has a right to be jealous, right? Like that, that's not, I'm sure y'all have seen like dating relationships. Maybe you've even been in where it's like the one person is like just overly jealous for no reason at all. Like that person is loyal, but in their brain, the jealousy like fabricates and makes up, oh, they're cheating on me, they're texting people. And it's even too where they're like, maybe they're just friends or it's like that person was, I don't know. So sometimes it's very, very petty things. But here, when we talk about covenant, God is like, we are in covenant. God is making a covenant with the Israelites in Exodus 20. And their affections is being, this worship, this affection in worship is being drawn away to worship other gods. In fact, saying, no, no, no. I'm a jealous God. You and I are in covenant. You will not worship these other gods because your affection belongs to me. Okay? Just like in marriage, my the, the love that I have for my wife is is hers and hers alone, okay? It's not to be, like, it's not, I'm not to be affectionate with other women. I'm not to, because then she would have every right to be jealous and upset, right? So that's the image that God is speaking to here. Um, but then also we see a little bit of, like, when you reject the Lord, it's going to affect you, your kids, you know, third and fourth generation, but... For those who love me and obey my commandments, he says, I lavish unveiling love for how long? A thousand. a thousand generations. Think how long that is. And think of, think to me, the perfect picture is Abraham. Abraham loved the Lord and obeyed what God had sold him. And now we have a thousand generations of Jews that are continuing to fall under the, the love of God being lavished on the nation of Israel. It's still continuing because of one man's faithfulness and love for the Lord. Uh, so it's just really a beautiful picture. Uh, so on the idea of worship, like God is saying, my, our worship, because as Christians, we are in covenant with Jesus. We have committed ourselves in covenant with the Lord. Our affection belongs to him. He is our God, and we are not to make idols for ourselves. Now, let me ask you guys. I know that when we talk about idols, like you and I don't have a, a carved metal statue that we bow down to in our, you know, in our house, in our dorm room, whatever. So what, what do idols look like in our lives today? And like, how do we know if there are idols in our lives? Phones? Okay. What do you mean? So talk about mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What, what might be on your phone though, that I think is, is, as it says here, gaining our affection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We love to be liked, in a sense. It's like we're, we want the, the recognition, we want the likes, we want the hearts on Instagram, whatever. It's just the attention, right? Other things. How, how do we recognize the idols in our life? Okay. So, talk me through. Um, you could be looking to get all of your all of your everything in time mm -hmm. from a relationship to mm -hmm. a relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Something that I'll stress to you guys, girls, is it's really easy in dating relationships to make that person the source of your happiness. Um, and you can tell this by, like, go back to last week or two weeks or three weeks. Whenever that person did something good, did you automatically just have, like, overwhelming like oh i'm love all and then when they did something that wasn't up to your expectation did you find that your mood or feelings just tanked and you you really fluctuate substantially in how they treat you and so we have to understand like healthy relationships as believers rely on god as our source that he is our source of joy he is our source of strength in difficult times and if you're looking at that other person to be your source of happiness, it's not going to go well because you're relying on another imperfect person to be your source. So like, for example, with me and Kara, or even with you and Sophie, like there's gonna be times where we as men make mistakes. And what happens is the ladies that we do love feel unloved. And when they feel unloved, now they're gonna be like, well, he must not love me. So I'm gonna, because he's now my source of love, and I'm not feeling love, I'm gonna to return to him unloved. And now you feel unloved, and so you return, and so just, 
instead of spiraling up because we're learning on God, it actually spirals down and it gets, it tanks, it gets worse. So you cannot rely on that other person to be your source. And in fact, even when we talk about agape love in the New Testament, which is a whole, is, is one-sided. It's unconditional, committed love, regardless of how the other person responds. And that's the love that God calls us to live. All right, let's go to Matthew chapter four now um, and talk a little bit with Jesus about worship. Um, so you guys are probably somewhat familiar with the temptations of Jesus, right? He fasts 40 days in the wilderness. He comes, uh, Satan comes and he tempts him. And we really see kind of three main temptations um, where he says, turn these, he's obviously he's hungry. He's, he's fasting for you. Turn these stones to bread and, and man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And then he takes him on the temple. He says, jump off. Because your angels will basically, it's promised that your angels will catch you. And then he says, hey, don't test the Lord. And then we have a third one. If Isaac, will you read verses 8 through 10? Chapter 4, 8 through 10. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain and showed him, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I'll give it all to you, he said, if you'll kneel down and worship me. Get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him. For the scriptures say, you must worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Man, I love I, I love the little little arc hands and then get out of here, Satan. <laughs> Sorry, uh, that's that's probably exactly how Jesus said it right there. Yeah. So what I want you guys to understand about worship is there's always an exchange that is available. Satan is offering Jesus, the Son of God, God Himself, in exchange. If you will worship me, I will give you the kingdoms of the world. I'll give you whatever your wildest dreams desire if you'll just fall down to worship. And we, I, I think it's kind of talking about jokingly, but I think it's probably far more real than we realize. When we think about uh, like famous actors and musicians that are talking about selling their soul for fame and fortune. Like this is what Satan is offering. And if you think this was only for Jesus, it's not. It's very much for us as well. That Satan is offering exchange. That if you will bow down and worship him, he will give you whatever earthly desires you want, but it will cost you your soul. It will cost you your eternity. When the worship, when we worship at the altar of the world, it promises you the world, but it costs you your soul. When you come to worship at the altar of God, the command is to lay down everything. But we receive back a life beyond our wildest dreams and our greatest joys. And this is what Jesus is speaking to in Luke 9, 24. He says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life, for my sake, you will save it. And what, sorry. Um, Luke 9, 25. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but are yourself lost or destroyed. So this is the image. Who you choose to worship will release the reward from heaven, from God, or Satan can give you all of your earthly desires, but you will lose your eternity. And so it's so important that we recognize the deception in the exchange. Uh, okay, so kind of zoom out. Here's a question for you guys. What are the strategies of, of the enemy, we'll say, um, but just in general, to steal our worship away from the Lord. So when you think about things that, that steal away your worship or things the enemy does to try and steal away your worship, what are some of your thoughts? Distract, yeah, absolutely. Bribery. Bribery. Yeah, it That's you, the exchange for sure. It gives you like that dopamine hit or mm -hmm. whatever it is and, and it keeps your attention keeps going back to it. Yeah. Other thoughts? What's going on in our Daniel chapter 4 story? What is what is the king doing to try and sell threats? Yeah, threats. For sure. He's threatening him. So the four that I have there, and I actually have one that we may get to that I felt like God gave me earlier a few hours ago. But first off, the exchange. 
which it should, yeah. The silencing. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to silence their worship, trying to keep them uh, from worshiping God. It's it's a threat. Um, three, and we'll get to this one in a second. We'll, we'll in a minute, we'll read over Acts 16. Um, but the discouragement. It's really easy when you're in places of discouragement and you feel like things are going wrong, things aren't going well, that you don't, why would I want to worship God? Like a thing, like I'm, things suck right now. Things are difficult. Um, God's not been coming through. Like we, we base it on our situation, our circumstances. And then fourthly, it, and we'll get to this eventually too, our insecurities. Our insecurities are played up and therefore that keeps me in a place of like reserved worship or I don't worship God at all because I'm seeing all my flaws and all my mistakes now. All right, so let's flip over to Acts 16 uh, and read that. Acts 16, 22 through 31. Uh, George, would you, be, would you be willing to read Acts 16, 22 through 31? Yeah, so Paul and Silas are arrested, thrown into prison. They're shackled to its foundation. And at midnight, they're worshiping God. They're singing praises to God. And this is, we have to discover how to worship God when we feel like we're in our own place of darkness and discouragement. Uh, because those are the places where we actually try to find internal spiritual freedom, even though our external situation may not have changed. Uh, and what's interesting is that this man is about to commit suicide, but because they speak up, his life is forever changed. Him, his family all become followers of Jesus. Uh, and so don't look. You may, there may be moments of discouragement where you don't feel like worshiping. And what you sing, you may not feel connected to. You may feel like you're just lip syncing, right? But it's so important that we learn to worship in our places of discouragement. Um, and Isaiah 61, 3 says this. Uh, it's speaking of, of Jesus. Uh, I, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he goes on and says, verse 3, To grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty and beauty, as a headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and then it says the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, and then the Berean Standard Bible says a garment of praise for a spirit of despair. So there's gonna be moments of despair and grief and discouragement that you're dealing with, and you have to learn to worship God because in those places, is where you receive that like this garment of praise is a garment is a covering and so it's a place where we find security and strength and it to move forward um, and it's not in a sense where we're, we're erasing like what we're facing it's just strength to keep us through that uh, and to bring freedom to our hearts even though it may not change our situation our circumstances okay and then uh, let's hit this last one. this is John chapter 12 
John chapter 12. Twelve one through eleven. Ian, would you be willing to read this John twelve one through eleven? You're good. Six days before the Passover celebration began, Jesus arrived in Bethany, the home of Lazarus, the man he had raised from the dead. A dinner was prepared in Jesus' honor. Martha served, and Lazarus was among those who ate with him. Then Mary took a 12-ounce jar of expensive perfume made from essence of nard. She anointed Jesus' Jesus' feet with it, wiping his feet with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance. But Judas Iscariot, the disciple who who would soon betray him, said, That perfume was worth a year's wages. It should not have been sold. And it should have been sold, and the money given to the poor. Not that he cares for the poor, he was a thief. And since he was in charge of the disciples' money, he often stole some for himself. Jesus replied, leave her alone. She did She did this in preparation for my burial. For my burial. You will always uh, have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him, and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priests decided to kill Lazarus too, for it, it was because of him that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Yeah. So for those who don't know Mary, this is Mary Magdalene, uh, her brother Lazarus, in the chapter before, chapter 11, dies and is brought back to life by Jesus. And so here in chapter 12, we see her response to Jesus bringing her brother back to life. Um, I'm I'm curious, how many of you have a brother? Only Georgia doesn't have a brother? Okay. So do you have any sibling? Do you have a sister? I mean, um, actually have brothers. Okay, we'll count that. Xavier and Samuel are half brothers, so. Okay. So think about that. Imagine your brother dies. He gets sick, he dies. And then four days later, Jesus shows up and brings your brother back to life. Think about your emotions in that. Think how much, you know, grief and sorrow and sadness. And then now, like overwhelming joy of my brother is back. And here is her response of worship to pour this uh, incredibly expensive perfume on Jesus' feet. Uh, And what is that met with? Criticism. Criticism, right? (laughs) Listen, only you know the cost of your worship. Only you know what God has brought you through, what he's done for you, your family, and, and there will be people when we choose to express our worship in genuine adoration and, and even over the top sacrifice, there will be criticism. But when we truly embrace what God has done for us, it won't matter. And to her, it didn't matter. Jesus had brought her brother back to life and she felt like it was a worthy act of worship. Um, more than likely, this is kind of like a I don't know this for sure, but most people kind of think this is like a family heirloom. Uh, Again, it says it could have been sold for a year's wage. So think about like what the average person makes in a year, and that's how much this cost. I mean, most people, you think of like their wage might purchase like a really nice car or something like that. So think that that's the equivalent value of this perfume. Um, So as she breaks this, and pours it on Jesus' feet, the whole room is now filled with these this intense fragrance. Like, because she didn't just pour a little bit, like she she broke it and she's pouring all of it on Jesus' feet and she dries it with her hair. So the room is filled with this fragrance. And then Jesus, as he goes towards Golgotha, goes towards the cross, his feet still smell of that fragrance. 
And as she's standing there with Mary, the mother of Jesus, in her hair is still the fragrance of this perfume. And so, listen, when we talk about our insecurities in worship, all, again, only you know what the Lord has done for you. And when you can truly see the incredible miracles and deliverance, because, again, she was a woman that had seven demons inside of her she was delivered of. She has more than enough to worship Christ that because of what he's done for her. And so when we truly see what God has done for us, we're not going to care what other people say. Our insecurities won't matter on, you know, like, well, you shouldn't be doing it that way, blah, blah, blah. Like, I am worshiping my king for what he has done for me. So I just want to challenge all of us to move past our insecurities that try and keep us silent, to try and keep us from worshiping God for what he's worthy of, and to offer him a sweet fragrance. And it's really interesting how in the Old Testament even it's brought up on several different occasions. When a, a burnt offering or sin offering, it says, and this was a sweet aroma to the Lord. And so I would just encourage you guys to really consider how does your worship smell to God? Is it something of incredible, I mean, again, a year's wage? Worship is worship. It's ascribing worth to God. God, what are you worth to me? And we, we figure that out in our willingness to sacrifice for him and our sacrifice of worship. Um, this is something even mentioned in Romans, that we offer our bodies as living sacrifices in worship to him. So just challenge all of us to move beyond our insecurities, to move beyond even our the way people are like criticizing us or on their perspective of us, and just worship God to the fullest that we can. To make great sacrifices and to glorify his name and to expand his kingdom. Okay. So let me let me pray. Lord God, I, I thank you for who you are. You are worthy of our worship. Whatever it costs us, whatever criticism may come our way, um, whatever dark places we may even find ourselves in because of our faithfulness to you, uh, whatever people try and silence that worship or even try and exchange it for other things, God, help us to remain loyal to you, that you alone deserve our worship. But there will always be other things fighting for that throne of our always fighting for our worship. So God, help us to be loyal to you and to worship you for what you deserve as the king of the universe and the savior of our souls. Lord, I love you. I thank you for all that you have done for us. In Jesus' name. Amen. So a, a couple of thoughts for you guys as far as like, some processing of prayer. And if you guys want to write this down, uh, I think we're, it's nine o'clock, so we're about out of time. Um, but just would encourage you to make time, maybe the later this evening or sometime this week and really process. So uh, I, I, I don't know, as I was preparing, I just kind of felt like these were five questions um, and really just considering where I'm at and maybe where God wants me to be at. So first of all, how's my heart? And in that is my place of desire. How do I feel about worship and again worship more than just music like worship based in these scriptures that we've studied uh, am I exchanging it for other things am I being silenced by others who are maybe not threatening my life but they're just like whatever the influence of others am I worth am I am I allowing my worship to be silenced because of the discouragement I'm facing or the insecurities I'm dealing with, whatever. So how's my heart? How's my desire for worship? How do I feel about it? And then how does God want me to feel about it? How does God want my desire to be? And what needs to change in order to meet his standard or move towards his standard? Um, how's my mind or my understanding of these things? What do I think about worship? What do I think about these the, the talk teaching tonight, the truths that are being proclaimed? How does God want me to think about these things? What does he want me to know about these things? How's my spirit, which speaks of like my connection with the Lord? 
Obviously, if we're not deeply connected, our, our level of connection with God is going to affect our worship. Uh, and so, how connected am I to, to the truths of worship? And then, how connected does God want me to be to this? Um, how, how much is this supposed to be connected to me on a daily basis? Um, how's my life, which is speaking of obedience, am I being obedient to what God has called me to be as uh, we see in John 4, God has called us to worship in spirit and in truth. So like that, that idea of obedience, am I being obedient to what God has called me to in worship? And then five is what's my battle? What's my, my opposition? Uh, what am I facing that is hindering me from worshiping God in the way he wants me to be and to the level he wants me to worship? Uh, and then how is God going to help me overcome those things? And am I actually trusting him to help me overcome and bring victory to my life?